Welcome to the Human Nature Channel. I'm your host, Alex Tam Sula, and what am I doing here? Well, it's Wednesday morning once again at my dad's recreative farm garage. I have one of the garage doors open behind me. This evening is a little too cool for the moths. Last week when I was doing my video, moths were showing up. I had to ask questions like, hey, who did you come with? Also last week, I was going to wear a World War II era civil defense helmet we have, but when I climbed the ladder to get to the display, it was nailed to the wall and I couldn't get it down. Oh well, so much for that bright idea. But I do have everything I need. I have got a pocket knife, actually a 59 cent pocket knife, in case I have to cut things short. I got a roll of masking tape. I got a pack for AAA batteries with only one battery in it. Please send all packets of AAA batteries to the Human Nature Channel, Post Office Box 81004, Pittsburgh, PA 15217. I've got my pointer with the magnet on it. I even got a fortune cookie, because who knows what tomorrow may bring. Okay, let's get started. One thing I truly enjoy about being a content creator on YouTube and specifically being a part of the Las Vegas Shooting Truth community is the network of people I have available to me. Lots of people who share my livid frustrations with the LVMPD fit report and the three-page FBI report. These are people I can bounce ideas off of. The comments section to my YouTube videos do play a large role in this, but so does my Human Nature Channel YouTube chats with Eric Peters and Concerned Citizen. You can call Eric and CC part of my mastermind group. If you've ever read Napoleon Hill's classic business book, Think and Grow Rich, you'll know what I'm talking about. The mastermind group is the big secret of the book, by the way. <clears throat> I happen to have a pretty serious mastermind group outside of YouTube, thank you very much. But Eric and Cece are the faction of my group directly engaged in the mystery of the Las Vegas shooting. Whenever Friday night rolls around, I'm staring at the blank page of Microsoft Word thinking, what the hell am I going to say next? But I shouldn't worry. Some idea always comes up. On Saturday morning, I was looking at the Human Nature Channel chat and reading some things Eric had to say. He was commenting on my message to Charlton about how the Las Vegas shooting could have been a message of some kind being sent to President Donald Trump. Eric doesn't buy into the notion that's been floated out there that Antifa played a role in the shooting. He doesn't believe ISIS was involved. But he does hold open the possibility that there was some group behind the Las Vegas shooting that Donald Trump cannot retaliate against. Maybe doing so would cause a great deal of embarrassment. I told Eric I liked the word embarrassment because the idea of embarrassment could play a major factor in the quality of the investigations we got from the LVMPD and the FBI. My Navy SEAL buddy Popeye said as much when I told him about my interest in the Las Vegas shooting. Of all the things in the FIT report that smelled of cover-up, he said more than likely they were trying to cover up police incompetence. Like the rest of us, Uncle Sam will do whatever it takes to avoid looking like an idiot. Which brings me to an assumption that all of us in the Las Vegas shooting truth community make. It's an easy assumption since we're dealing with officialdom's wall of silence. The FBI issues a report shorter than the instruction manual to a space heater, but the length doesn't matter. It's the official stamp, the last word. It signals to America that the case is closed and there's nothing else to talk about. Well, I say the shorter the report, the bigger the web behind the Las Vegas shooting. 
the FBI should have titled their report, All We're Allowed to Say. The assumption when it comes to the Las Vegas Route 91 Harvest Festival massacre is that Donald Trump has done nothing. But is that true? I'm going to tell you a story that you won't believe. The date is December 14th, 2012. I woke up that morning horribly hungover. I don't mean just hungover. I was feeling sicker than shit. The night before, I had been at a buddy's house, and we were drinking and watching movies until about 1 a.m. Now, we had been doing this sort of thing every Thursday for years. Whenever it was time for my buddy to hit the hay, I'd pack up my stuff and leave and walk home. Usually, I'd wake up the next morning semi-hungover, but after coffee and cigarettes and moving around, I'd feel normal around noon. But that Friday... I woke up and I was really hurting. It's like I'd caught some 24-hour bug on top of being hungover. I managed to make it to the kitchen and make some coffee. Then I said to myself, today ain't happening. And I went back to bed. Keep in mind, I had not turned on the television and had not heard the news. I had no idea what had happened out there. About four in the afternoon, I rolled out of bed and was feeling at least functional. That's when I had some information sent my way. I can't tell you how I got this information because you won't believe that either. But it was something like this. A blonde woman somewhere was standing before the gray marble facade of a building. It was daytime. She was wearing a short black strap dress and she had a handbag over her left shoulder. She was holding a smartphone in her right hand. When she raised it to her ear, she took a bullet to her forehead. I remember thinking, what the hell is this? Plus, the fact that the dress had her with bare arms and shoulders meant it couldn't have been from around here. This was December in Pittsburgh. By 5 o'clock, I was in my car driving to Squirrel Hill. I put on the radio and it was the first time that I heard the news out of Sandy Hook. My jaw was hanging open as I got the story. Now the information I got could have been bogus. It could have been disinformation. It could have been something that had nothing to do with anything. Just because I went into a type of shock from these two events happening in a short space of time doesn't prove anything. or. Somebody behind Sandy Hook in some way got whacked. Here is a sketch I made based on the information I received. My point is a president can sign an executive order to terminate some bad actor posing an imminent threat. Remember all that controversy around the Obama administration when the idea of targeted assassinations was raised? My attitude was, so what? There had been Anwar al-Awlaki, the New Mexico-born radical Islamic imam who counseled Major Nadal Hassan, the Fort Hood shooter. We hell-fired Anwar's ass. There's nothing new about this. In the past, presidents have terminated with extreme prejudice individuals who really meant to do America some serious damage. These are the types of situations where the black ops people are brought in. Can we be sure Donald Trump has done nothing when it comes to the Las Vegas shooting? No, we can't. And he's not going to tell us if he did. National security, you understand. Alex has lots of stories like this one about the dead blonde. Since 2002, I've been an amateur provocateur with a presentation that connects Hillary Clinton to 9-11. I've been at it on various blogs. I've told the story to news outlets via email. I've spelled it out on Twitter, but nobody wanted to hear it. Maybe I should do another video with my danger sandblasting sign in the background and tell that story so many more people can get the opportunity to not want to hear it. As much as I enjoy our little get-togethers in my dad's farm garage, I might have to skip a week or two from this just to get that story down. 
Being a provocateur for the last 17 years has been an adventure. There's been some close calls, like the time I was happy I didn't step off the curb a second sooner when that beer truck ran a red light. But basically, it's been all about the very interesting people I've met. Squirrel Hill, in case you didn't already know, is the heart of Jewish life in Pittsburgh, and post 9-11, it would be a place more attuned to threats and more on guard. People I've met in the last 17 years were some of the finest you could imagine. Really amazing folks. I'm the only person I know who can say I'm friends with a Navy SEAL, a gangster, and two ninjas. If you have friends like that, Please, drop me a line. There was even a bad guy who actually was a good friend of mine until he became heavily involved with cocaine and totally alienated me. He was a bad guy, but he was a small potatoes bad guy. The others went after him to get to the big cheese bad guy. That was the end of my involvement in that. I said in my last video I think Teresa was sent my way and I believe this was a direct result of my trolling Hillary Clinton for the last 17 years. I do know who the jerk-offs are who sent her my way. The come on was this. Teresa was retiring from organized crime and told me I'm too old and too tired to do this shit anymore. Now, somebody must have clued her into the fact that I had written and self-published a novel, so I knew what it took to write a book. She wanted me to write her biography. Oh, my goodness. In preparation for this, she handed me bunches of newspaper articles on organized crime in Pittsburgh. At the time, I thought, I love reading true crime. Writing it might be just as much fun. Little did I know. What happened instead was her boss was released from prison after six years and got in touch with Teresa. And it was back to work for her. So much for retirement. Interesting timing, that. Now, don't get me wrong. I actually like Teresa. We got along really well. More often than not, it was a lot of laughs. Now, she told me she was bipolar, and when she was between the mood swings, she was the most exciting, dynamic woman I'd ever met. But when she was in one of those serious extremes, that's when things got interesting. I don't hold anything against Teresa. I miss her. In some respects, she didn't have any choice. But the Bums who weaponized a felon with a monster drug usage level like I've never seen before and sent her my way, where she was always borrowing cash that I rarely got back, those assholes who wanted to cause me that level of grief are going to get theirs. One of the bums I know who is part of this scheme to send Teresa my way once showed me a personal letter he received from former President Bill Clinton. It's not hard to guess the loyalty of these people. Were they acting from orders on high? If you were in my shoes, what would you think? Oh, by the way, a year and a half after I was told Teresa had died from a drug overdose, I subscribed to one of those websites that do background checks. No death certificate, of course. I love my job. Teresa would get mad at me if I started talking like a gangster. She was so sweet. Anyway, this is what I bring to the Las Vegas shooting truth community. It's a big world out there and nothing exists in a vacuum, including something as horrendous as the Route 91 Harvest Festival Massacre. My experiences have taught me there's always something going on behind the curtains. A lot of activity most of us aren't supposed to see. 
When I originally started typing the script for this video, the theme was going to be how the Las Vegas shooting fit into America's media-driven grievance and resentment cultures. All those anti-Second Amendment types like the Parkland kids, they spent a scant amount of time talking about the Las Vegas shooting, the greatest mass shooting in modern American history. You all know what I'm talking about like all the snark about how those rednecks got what they deserved. Sheriff Joe Lombardo even got politically correct on us when he said the Las Vegas shooting had an influence of a certain demographic of people intended to cause harm. Instead of the bureaucratic gobbledygook, Sheriff Joe should have said the concert goers at the Route 91 festival were targets because somebody had a bug up their ass about white privilege. It's basically saying the same thing, but Sheriff Joe is hiding behind weasel words. Weasel words. There's that curtain again where we can feel something going on behind it, but we can't figure out exactly what. My question was going to be, did the Las Vegas shooting find its origins in grievance culture? I'm going to have to do a separate video on that. Speaking as we were earlier of bad actors getting whacked, I heard this story one time about a female intelligence agent. She took three napkins and pushed them deep inside her vagina, then followed them with a mercury thermometer glass end in. The trick here would be to bear down at the right time. When the big cheese bad guy slipped his dick in, that thermometer went right up into it. He probably pulled out screaming something like, what the fuck is this? The female intelligence agent then reached up, grabbed his prong, and gave it a good hard squeeze. That must have been a nasty way to die. And somebody somewhere decided the big cheese deserved it. Just one more thing behind the curtain that we're not supposed to see. Oh, and the song. You Don't Mess Around With Jim by Jim Croce. I had this on a 45. Oh, man. <laughs> Good evening. How do you top a story like Woman Kills Man with Thermometer in Vagina? It's hustlers, the Bowery got its bums. 42nd Street got Big Jim Milwaukee, he's a pool shooting son of a gun. Yeah, he big and dumb as a man can come, but he's stronger than the country hoss. And when the bad folks all get together at night, you know, they all call Big Jim boss just because. And they say you don't tug on Superman's cape, you don't spit into the wind. You don't pull the mask off that old Lone Ranger and you don't mess around with Jim. Ba -doom -dee -bee -dum -dee 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 -dee. Well, out of South Alabama come a country boy. He said, I'm looking for a man named Jim. I am a pool shooting boy. My name is Willie McCoy, but down home they call me Slim. Yeah, I'm looking for the king of 42nd Street. He's driving a drop top Cadillac. Last week he took all my money, and it may sound funny, but I come to get my money back. And everybody say, Jack, woo, don't you know? You don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit into the wind. You don't pull the mask off that old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with Jim. I do 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 dee 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 dee. Well, a hush fell over the pool room. Jimmy come bopping in off the street. And when the cutting were done, the only part that wasn't bloody was the soles of the big man's feet. Yeah, he was cutting about a hundred places, and he was shot in a couple more. And you better believe they sung a different kind of story when a big Jim hit the floor. Uh -huh. Now they say you don't tug on Superman's cape, you don't spit into the wind. You don't pull the mask off that old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with Slim. Yeah, Big Jim got his hat, 
find out where it's at and it's not hustling people strange to you. Even if you do got a two-piece custom-made pole cue. Yeah, you don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit into the wind. You don't pull the mask off that old Lone Ranger and you don't mess around with a Slim. <laughs> Yeah, you'll never know what you'll find in my dad's farm garage. Later.